Hey everybody, it's week eight, and this week, as you can see, I want to talk about um, this idea of executive legislative tension and and administration, and then how it relates to this week's readings. So I'm going to take this in. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about the readings a little bit. Then I want to talk about this idea of executive legislative tension. Then I want to come back to how that uh, impacts administration. And so I hope actually by this time that a lot of these readings that we're doing in this foundations course are starting to come together for you. And, and you can see how a lot of these things relate to what we do as administrators. Uh, and that's going to lead to the question, uh, kind of the open-ended question, just like I did last week, that I want you to consider on the discussion board. So let me start right into that. Okay, so Fry wrote this article about Gulick. It's really excerpted from a book. And I want to talk about some of the things that Fry had to say about Gulick for just a moment. So here's about three quotes here that I drew from the, the piece that I think are important. First of all, you see, you see the first one says that perhaps the strongest of Gulick's emphases is the enhancement of executive power, um, both within organizations and among uh, the organizations of the executive branch. So really what Gulick was saying was that organizations in general, in government or private, um, that the uh, chief executive was really the key component in terms of leading the organization. Um, and he said that uh, executive power was weak particularly in government organizations and need, needed to be strengthened. Uh, he also said that neither the public nor the legislature is capable of the planning needed uh, by effective government. So in Gulick's mind, um, planning was a key element of effective government. So you remember this POSDACORB acronym that we refer to, the P is the planning part of that. Um, there's a reason it's first, because he believed that good government is planned government. And then Third, he said that ideal government is one in which the chief executive, supported by special staff, draws the plans. There's that plans word again. And the legislature's job is to accept or reject proposed policies. So really, that's kind of turning the veto power on its head, isn't it? Um, that the executive comes up with plans. And really, it's the legislature's job to review that and veto it if necessary. Um, now, why is Gulick important? not just Pazdacorb, which we've talked about, but um, he is one of three members of this this uh, entity called the Brownlow Committee, along with Lewis Brownlow and Charles Merriam, which became a very important effort in terms of how the uh, White House Office of the President was reorganized during the administration of Franklin Roosevelt. And this becomes very important for uh, presidential administrations to follow. And so Fry talks about the seven key points that Gulick made with reference to executive power or executive leadership, if you will. First, he said that government does play a positive role in society. Um, really, he said that government acts or should act only when there's market failure. Um, so think of market failure as uh, occurring because the private sector can't due to the market. There's no equilibrium price or doesn't really want to deliver products such as public goods like city parks. So government steps in to do this. But Gulick also believed that there shouldn't be this wall of separation necessarily between public and private sectors, that that's not desirable. What's really desirable is public-private cooperation. He said that the executive branch at all levels of government should propose and implement policies while the legislative should be limited to approval or rejection of those executive proposals. We talked about that. Again, uh, we actually see this in effect in most states, for example, wherein the governor's job is to propose a budget and the job of state legislatures is to 
modify that budget, debate that budget, come up with a budget of their own. But typically, what you see at state level, when the when the final budget is voted on, whether they approve a budget for one year or two years, um, the final budget resembles something that the governor submitted, albeit with uh, modifications from the legislature. Uh, but the the constitutional expectation in most states is that the governor will propose the budget. Um, he says that the chief executive should be strengthened through improved staff support, uh, consolidation of departments, and reduction of the number of elected officials, particularly at state and local levels. So this sounds like he's f trying to flatten organizations. That's what we might call it today. He says that better collaboration between levels of government should be strived for. What he was talking about there was that he thought at, you know, between the national level, the state level and the local levels, collaboration was lacking. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting to me that collaboration and networking have become very popular terms within the last 20 years or so in public administration. But this was in the 1930s that Gulick was saying this. Um, he said that administrators are necessarily involved in political and policy matters. And so this speaks to this idea of the politics administration dichotomy, right? And we've talked about this at length, but uh, Gulick is saying that uh, if for no other reason than expertise, at least top administrators are, they're always involved in policy matters um, because at the very least, they're giving recommendations on what policy should resemble. He says that scientific methods should be employed to understand general principles of administration. Gulick really is all about trying to come up with a science, a universal science, if you will, of administration. And then finally, he says top leaders in executive branch organizations should coordinate and integrate activities to achieve unity of purpose. So what he's really talking about here is if you if you think of a typical cabinet, president's cabinet, that there should be unity of purpose between the departments, between the State Department and the Defense Department. There should be unity of purpose um, instead of several different departments running in several different directions. And so what what Gulick really was advocating um, was better and more uh, what he considered more scientific and rational control within executive departments. And so let's move on to Brownlow. I said that Gulick was one of three key members of the Brownlow committee. So the Brownlow committee was organized by Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR, um, during the New Deal because suddenly the White House had thrust upon it many more uh, responsibilities to worry about. Um, so what did this Brownlow committee do? These three members of the Brownlow committee uh, really came up with a series of recommendations, which ultimately found their way into law and reorganization of the White House. And so here were the key organizations um, from the Brownlow committee. Uh, First, they said the White House staff should be expanded, just expanded. Then they said managerial agencies, particularly those dealing with budgets, efficiency research, personnel and planning should be strengthened, strengthened as in more expert staff at it. Uh, that the merit system already in existence since the Civil Service Reform Acts way back in the late 1800s should be extended upward, outward and downward to attract the best talent to government service. So really what, what they're saying is they are trying to encourage expertise in government uh, through the merit system. And that the whole executive branch of government should be overhauled and reduced to a few large departments. So here again, we see uh, Gulick's influence that really we should see some kind of flattening of government organizations into large logical departments, each headed by an executive uh, that could more efficiently do the work of government. And finally, that uh, that the organization of government should rely on the application of best government and private practices 
So here we, we kind of see uh, this idea of best practices, which you probably hear a lot about still best practices. So that's the reading. Let me stop there right now because, and this isn't a very good transition, but um, where does all this have its genesis? And I want to take you back to uh, why was this even necessary? Well, it's necessary because of the way the United States and our states really are constitutionally organized. Now, we spent several weeks, or a couple of weeks anyway, talking about the Constitution and the Federalist Papers. And so at this point in the lecture, what I want to do is, is integrate what Gulick and Brownlow had to say with the reason behind it was even necessary to talk about that. And that is this, that the Constitution really lays out a system of tension. We say that the Constitution has checks and balances. That's true. That's a positive spin. The negative spin is the Constitution lays out a system of tensions. Tensions between the executive and the legislative. Tension between the judicial and the legislative and the judicial and the executive. Um, but primarily what we want to talk about is this tension between Congress and the president and then sort of apply it to all levels of government. So what's the constitutional view of Congress? So let's go back and think about what we talked about in weeks one and two, the Constitution itself. When the Constitution talks about the legislative branch of government, it's in Article One, the very first article. It, was that by design that they said the legislative was Article One, the president was Article Two, and the judicial was Article Three? Is that an order of priority or precedence? Perhaps. Um, I don't know. But here's what the Constitution has to say about Congress. It talks about the vice president in Section 3, really as a member of the Senate. So you can think about that for a second. What would have happened if John Adams, the very first vice president, had not become bored with, with sitting in the Senate? He famously despised sitting in the Senate and, and he didn't do it very much. What if he had not taken that approach? How would the role of vice president have changed vis-a-vis -vis the Senate and vis-a-vis -vis the president? Um, we know that one house is chosen by a direct vote and the suffrage was very limited then, but it was the House of Representatives was chosen by a direct vote and one chosen by state legislatures. There was tension there. Uh, we know that in, the, in Article 1, revenue bills originate in the House. That is the House selected by voters, but they have Senate concurrence. We know that in Article 1 that it is the Congress that has the power of taxation, including setting duties and tariffs. We know that it is the Congress uh, who has the power to borrow money. We know that it is the, con the Congress who has the power to coin money or establish a common currency. Uh, importantly, it is the Congress who has the power to declare war. In the Constitution, it is the Congress that says we are at a in a state of war with country X. The Congress has the power to fund the military, but only for two year appropriations. So apparently, uh, you know, 10 and 15 year procurements of major weapon systems, maybe those weren't in the mind of the founders. Uh, we know that the Congress has the power to govern the military. And, though, and then we know that finally, uh, Congress has this necessary and proper power, as it's called, the power to make laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into ex execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested in this Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or officer thereof. So that part's really important. Um, vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or officer thereof. So Congress has a role in setting the rules for the executive departments. And of course, there is debate over how wide that role is. So what, what's the Constitution say about the presidency? So we know famously that the, the, the Article 2 says 
that the executive power is vested in a president of the United States. So what does that mean in terms of administration? You know, we could think of that as executive power being administrative power being vested in a president of the United States. That is one way of looking at that. Um, we also know though that the president, when the constitution was written, was elected indirectly by electors. And these electors were chosen by states with state discretion on the method of picking those electors. They weren't all elected. Most of them weren't at the time. In fact, they were selected by state legislatures. We know that the president is the commander in chief of the army and Navy and of the militia. And we use that term all the time now, but it really, what the constitution says is when called into the actual service of the United States. We know that the president has the power to uh, require the opinion in writing of the principal officer in each executive department. Now that seems like a, a mild statement, you know, dear secretary of state, I'd like your opinion. Um, to what we think of now is that the secretary of state uh, that works for the president without question. And we're surprised that this kind of language is in, in the constitution. Um, we know that the president has the power to make treaties with the advice and consent of the Senate. Same with appointing particular officers as in Supreme court justices. And then, uh, finally, interestingly enough, it says, you know, from time to time, the president will give to, to the Congress information on the state of the union. Well, you know, state of the union addresses weren't always the show that they are now, uh, for a while, giving the state of the union was just the president writing a letter to Congress saying, this is what I believe the state of the union is. And then finally, the constitution does say that the president can submit legislation when it says that the president will recommend for Congress's consideration measures as he shall judge necessary and expedient. Interestingly enough, there is a power for the president to adjourn and convene Congress seldom used. Um, what there is no constitutional provision for, for example, is the requirement to present a budget to Congress. Um, you could read it into the previous statement and there is no ability for a president to declare war at all in the constitution. This slide we, we had in an earlier lecture, but I wanted to go back to it just because I wanted to um, kind of complete the circle on this. You know, in Federalist 51, where either Madison or Hamilton said, ambition must be made to counteract ambition. Um, so they're talking about a separation of powers kind of government, assuming ambition of humans, that this ambition counteracts ambition. But, but they said in a republic, you see in the bold type there right in the middle, the legislative authority necessarily predominates. And that's why it has two houses, um, because it is the dominant house. It necessarily predominates. And they saw the executive as automatically the weakest branch basically only having a veto power over law. So the question is, is this still true that the executive is the weakest branch? I mean, I think most people would argue that the executive in many ways has surpassed the legislative as the strongest branch of our separation of powers government. And so I thought of this as I was giving this lecture, I came up with this thing called the famous or recent president syndrome. This isn't really a real thing. Um, it's really probably an informal and untestable hypothesis. But what I wanted to talk about here is this idea that the presidents that we remember are those who are most recent, of course, who have occurred in our lifetime. But there are others from the history of our nation that we remember in particular. And why do we remember these famous presidents? I would argue that one of the reasons we remember many of these famous presidents is because they actually enhanced the power of the presidency. So for example, I have a couple slides on this. Um, 
what if the first president had not been George Washington? So I say, would permanent legislative dominance have resulted with a less revered first president? George Washington was very revered uh, in 1787. There is absolutely no doubt of that. And, but what if instead of electing George Washington, someone not quite as revered was elected first president? Would that have limited the power of the president forever? What if the 1800 election uh, of Jefferson and Burr ultimately ha had not gone the way it did? Um, if you read the history, you find out that there were, I think, 30 some ballots in the House of Representatives that finally resulted in Jefferson being elected president and Burr being elected vice president, but they ran together on a ticket. But that election resulted in the 12th Amendment, which facilitates the way we do elections now. Remember, when the Constitution was written, what it said was the person with the most electoral votes became president, the person with the second most became vice president. Um, that election messed that up and it, it resulted in necessitating the 12th Amendment. But really then that put emphasis on presidential elections. Uh, Jefferson, of course, a very famous president, famous for the Declaration of Independence, but he's also famous for purchasing Louisiana, uh, where Nebraska is located, uh, basically doubling the size of the United States. But he did that without consultation and he did it in a hurry. Um, and he agreed with France to buy their territory. Uh, Jackson, without a law, forced the mass deportation of the Cherokee and other nations to what was called the Indian Territory that became the state of Oklahoma, but from their native lands, really without the approval of Congress. Jackson is also credited with coming up with the spoils system we've talked about. Lincoln, arguably the most famous president um, worldwide, suspended the writ of habeas corpus, effectively kept Maryland and other border states in the Union through martial law, uh, he put people in jail who uh, were opposed to the war without due process. He issued the Emancipation Proclamation, which was a wartime measure and applied only in the states in rebellion. And that later was followed by the 13th Amendment. But Lincoln took some extraordinary measures for a president in order to prosecute the war. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt used extensive executive orders and other devices really to expand the national park system. The national park system was created by law, but Roosevelt himself used parts of other laws to declare national monuments and other national sites to actually get around the national park law. Um, moving on, Franklin Roosevelt greatly expanded the office of the president, as we've talked about. He used New Deal legislation to expand presidential control over the entire economy. Uh, Truman issued an executive order, among many others, integrating the armed forces. He did that without Congress. Truman entered into an undeclared war in Korea. Eisenhower and Kennedy sent advisors to Vietnam. And then the Johnson and Nixon administration ended up fighting another undeclared war in Vietnam. And the result of that was a pushback by Congress in what we call the War Powers Act. Um, President Nixon innovated this idea of impounding appropriations that had been appropriated by law. He just said, I'm not going to spend that money the way Congress said. We know that President Reagan, uh, the first President Bush, President Clinton, the second President Bush and President Obama have all fought undeclared wars in Grenada, in Iraq, in Panama, in the former republics of Yugoslavia, in Afghanistan, and in Iraq again. Uh, we were involved in Somalia in the 1990s. And so all these were done outside of declarations of war. In fact, we have not had a, a war declared since World War II. Here is, uh, because I'm in the military, or was in the military, I, I'm interested in this kind of topic, but this is a very important act, and this is an act where Congress uh, 
actually expanded the power of the president. This is called the authorization for the use of military force. Um, this is actually the act from September 2001, three days after 9-11, that uh, authorized the president to commit military forces to combat terrorism. And you can read the, the preamble to this, the, all these whereas statements. Whereas on September 11th, acts of treacherous violence were committed against the United States and its citizens. Um, whereas such acts render it both necessary and appropriate that the United States exercise its rights to self-defense and to protect the United States citizens at home and abroad. Um, and you can see the rest of those whereas statements. You can stop the video and look at those for a second. But I want to move on to what the authorization of the use of military force says. Um, so right there in bold, right in the middle, the authorization for the use of military force um, post 9-11 is that those 60 words or so, that the president is authorized to use all necessary and appropriate force against those nations, organizations, or persons he determines planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attacks that occurred on September 11th, 2001, or harbored such organizations or persons in order to prevent any future acts of international terrorism against the United States by such nations, organizations, or persons. Well, that is not a declaration of war, but it is the Congress basically telling the president that he can use all necessary and appropriate force. Uh, president George W. Bush and President Barack Obama and whoever the next president is will all be using this authoriz authorization of the use of military force without a declaration of war. There are other acts of Congress which have strengthened the presidency. One that you're going to learn about probably uh, in your budget and accounting class, in your uh, public budgeting class, I guess, is that uh, the budgeting and the Budget and Accounting Act of 1921. Um, it wasn't until 1921 that anything resembling an executive budget was submitted to Congress. So from 1780. Nine through 1920, the way departments in the United States government were funded was that each department submitted a budget request to Congress, which may or may not have had coordination of the president. In 1921, Congress said, we want the whole, entire budget to be submitted by the president, and then we will work with that budget. Um, that budget set up something called the Bureau of the Budget, which now is called the Office of Management and Budget. Um, but that was the first time that executive budgeting was was uh, authorized. In 1974, Congress tried to take back some budgeting power um, in a reaction to President Nixon's empowerment of appropriated funding by creating uh, this Congressional Budget and Empowerment Control Act of 1974. In that act, they, they created what we now have as the Congressional Budget Office, whose job it is to expertly review uh, all budget implications for the budgets that the president submits and also the budgets that members of Congress ultimately uh, organize as the final budget. Um, the Reorganization Act of 1939 along with a joint resolution of Congress and an executive order established the executive office of the president. This is where we see the Brownlow connection. Uh, the Brownlow committee, uh, its recommendations were basically the impetus for this act, which greatly expanded the uh, office, executive office of the president under President Franklin D. Roosevelt. The Administrative Procedures Act of 1946 is another act that you will encounter, especially as you start to study policy. What does this act do? This act is really the act that lays out the procedures for the establishment of regulations and rulemaking within the executive agencies and departments. And so I think you all know that not all policy are just a specific law. Many are derivative of law. The rules and regulations that are promulgated by agencies like uh, the Food and Drug Administration, the Environmental Protection Agency, are really rules uh, 
that have been created based on the rule making uh, processes in the Administrative Procedures Act. But that greatly strengthens um, administrative agencies, which are nominally under the Executive Department. The National Security Act of 1947 greatly increased the president as commander, his power, I should say, as commander in chief by establishing this single Department of Defense along with the National Security Council, which is a very important link in the president's uh, national security policy making apparatus. There was another Reorganization Act of 1949, which expanded the executive office of the president even more. And that was based on another commission called the Hoover Commission. And then finally, this authorization for the use of military force. There are others. There, these are some that I highlighted just to basically indicate that this tension between the president and Congress isn't always one sided. It's not just a, a presidential power grab by successive presidents it is really uh, a lot of authorize, authorization by Congress to increase the strength of the office of the president. And so there are a couple of other ways that people popularly in uh, in the media and otherwise talk about that uh, as some people say are illegal acts that presidents have done uh, and in particular, they point to recent presidents, and these are the devices called signing statements and executive orders. Um, I get a lot of this information uh, that I'm gonna talk about here from something called um, the American Presidency Project, and I give you the link down there. But signing statements are basically uh, something the president does uh, when a law is passed. And typically what it is is a, a way for a president to express uh, some reservations about a bill that that is being signed anyway, or more controversially, the president might indicate that he won't appropriate the funds for the law that Congress appropriates. Um, or the president might say, I'm signing this, but I think it's unconstitutional. And the earliest of these statements can be traced back to um, President Monroe when Congress talked about the way the military officer corps should be organized. He signed the law, but he said, I, I have doubts that the, the that what you wrote in the law is, is constitutional. Um, now the American Bar Association had a blue ribbon commission in 2006. They didn't necessarily speak for the entire association, but they said that, that signing statements undermine the rule of law and our constitutional separation of powers. And what they said was instead of signing statements, what presidents should do is veto laws, but they, don't want to veto them, so they put in signing statements to give themselves ways of perhaps skirting the law. Executive orders. Now, executive orders are something you will hear about quite often, right? And I'm not going to defend or detract from any one president, um, but a lot of people within the last, let's say, 16 years have talked about these two presidents, George W. Bush and Barack Obama. Well, this chart goes through September of 2016. Um, uh, President Bush signed 291 executive orders. President Obama signed 252. So they're probably going to have about the same amount of executive orders. I mean, executive orders are looked at sometimes as ways of presidents skirting laws. So for example, I referred to President uh, Truman. President Truman signed an executive order that integrated the armed forces. And he didn't ask for Congress to, to do, you know, write a law that did that. He just did it through executive order. But President Truman had 907 executive orders. Theodore Roosevelt had a thousand executive orders. Woodrow Wilson had 1800. Even Calvin Coolidge and Warren Harding, who were thought to be very conservative, had uh, many executive orders along with Herbert Hoover. Roosevelt had an unprecedented number of executive orders. So executive orders aren't something that just started. They've been going on since George Washington, even though George Washington only signed eight of them. However, it is true to say that since the 20th century, since Theodore Roosevelt, the number of executive orders are average over 100 per year for all presidents, whereas up to about 
1900, they only averaged about 11 per year. So executive orders have become much more popular with 20th century and 21st century presidents, and perhaps as a way of doing things without having to go through Congress to write a law. This slide here I got from the American Presidency Project, and this goes back to the idea that at least as budgets are concerned, the Congress is still quite powerful. What this, this slide points to is the difference in appropriations between the President and Congress. The zero line is right here. So what this means is in these years, the President actually, or the Congress actually appropriated more money than the President asked for. And these, these are organized by um, entire presidential administrations. So during the Truman administration, the Congress overall actually appropriated more money than President Truman asked for. Uh, whereas in President Carter's administration, the Congress appropriated money, less money than President Carter asked for. So this is very interesting, the way that Congress and the president differ on budgets. This, this right here will give you more of an idea. Um, particularly in the area of defense, it's very common for, it has been common for Congress to give more money than the president asked for for defense. Note Truman here, um, note President Carter, President Reagan even, uh, and sometimes less money. So think of President Nixon, $16 billion less than he asked for during his administration. Well, think of what was happening during the Nixon administration, and that was the Vietnam War. And especially as the Vietnam War drug out, the Congress grew less and less uh, enthusiastic about the war effort and began to provide less appropriated money to the administration to prosecute the war. But on the non-defense side, it's a different story. So more money being appropriate to the Nixon and Nixon Ford administrations than either of those presidents asked for. More money for non-defense on in the Reagan administration. Far less money for non-defense in the Clinton administration. So what this is telling us is that at least as far as the budget uh, is concerned, the rivalry between the president and the Congress is probably alive and well. Okay, so now at this point, we're what? Oh gosh, I'm 37 minutes into this. Um, so great, this is a record for me. But the so what? Um, what does this mean to us as administrators? Well, here's, here's some things to keep in mind uh, as administrators. One is, uh, in spite of what people say, the Constitution was not designed for efficiency, it was designed to check ambition through a method of separation of powers. Ambition counteracts ambition. Um, to varying degrees of similarity, state constitutions and local city charters are designed to pro also provide for the separation of powers. So think of governors and legislatures or mayors and councils. Um, next, remember what Wilson said. Wilson thought the constitution was actually problematic and inefficient because the smooth administration of government was hindered by or sullied by politics. Uh, he really wanted a more efficient way of doing government's business. Uh, we read about the progressive era and we read that some progressives thought that city charters could be much more administratively viable if cities were reformed. Well, what did they mean by reform? What they meant by reform was actually essentially removing separation of powers by having a council hire professional administrators who work directly for the council. We remember reading um, this debate between Rohr and Spicer and Terry and Stivers, and they all proposed different ways, but some degree of administrative independence, um, or perhaps somehow having administrators selecting which branch of government to obey. And what we're gonna see in a few weeks, we're gonna talk about the reinventing government um, movement in the 1990s. And this was based on the idea that government is not operating in an efficient way. Well, we know if we watch elections that it continues to be popular for candidates running for any kind of office from local county commission offices on up to congressional seats to pledge that they will run 
government like a business. And we still have people in 2016, Americans who contend that Congress is broken because it's inefficient. It, can't, it cannot pass budgets and needed laws in a timely manner. So having said all that, I'm working my way up to this, I promise, the week seven discussion. Um, and as I, as I give you this question, what I want you to do is actually be complimented because I am so impressed, and I, I know I've said this before, I'm so impressed by the quality of writing that you all are turning in and, and the thinking that goes into your, your uh, ideas. I really want to encourage you to continue to develop these coherent thoughts and debate them with each other because this is really, to me, this is what graduate learning is all about. Everyone reading the same literature and then and then being able to come up with different ideas about them. So uh, what I'd like you to do for this week's discussion, using all the literature that we've had so far, but in particular this week, um, I'd like you to answer this question. And that is, how does the built-in and historic rivalry between the legislative and executive branches in our national, state, and local constitutions affect the administration of government? And so what I mean by the administration of government is the whole body of laws and rules and regulations that prescribe what government is supposed to do and what we as administr administrators are supposed to do in carrying that out. So uh, I'm looking forward to a great discussion on this question and a lot of expansive a lot of expansive thought. So thanks very much for listening to me this far and I am I'm looking forward to your discussion. Thank you.